Colby and I sit down with Mariners president of baseball operations, Jerry DePoto, coming up here on the Locked On Mariners podcast. Colby, hit it. You are Locked On Mariners, your daily Seattle Mariners podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ahoy, sailors. It is Thursday, March 7th, 2024. This is Tidings Allison and Colby Patnode, who has the absolute most insane lighting in this interview. You've probably already seen it on Twitter, but it is ridiculous. It's it doesn't look like that in real life. I don't know what's happening. Like, I don't know. Something's happening the way with this your looks camera right now. There's like a weird like red tint. From yeah, my there's like a, I think your I think your camera broke. <laughs> I don't know. Thankfully, and we can just make this announcement now. You're going to have a new recording studio by opening day so there you go Somebody hopefully they're supposed to have theirs too but they got a little lazy. yeah i i gotta i gotta i got some work to do over the next three weeks hey, you have the entire day look at that that's true that's true mm. anywho as i was saying this is tiding is all and colby patnode for the locked on marriage podcast which is brought to you of course by game time download the game time app create an account and use the promo code locked on that's l-o-c-k-d-o-n for twenty dollars off your first purchase Thank you so much for making us your first listen. Subscribe, like, and turn on alerts if you're watching on YouTube. Or subscribe and leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform if you like what you hear. And if you're part of the crew and rock with us every single day, let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. And if you want to hear from us even more, please consider signing up for our Patreon. You can now get a free seven-day trial to check out the show. The link, as well as our social accounts, is in the description of this episode. And of course, we have a very special guest joining us today mariners president of baseball operations jerry depoto we talked about overcoming the astros and rangers maneuvering the trade market the possibility of extensions for guys like cal raleigh and logan gilbert and a whole lot more so let's get into it really excited to welcome back on the show jerry depoto mariners president of baseball operations jerry thanks for doing this how's it going i'm glad to do it guys uh, not too bad we we got in the uh the wind column yesterday so all things are good <laughs> that's good that's good it's been a, a very interesting last few months for you in that front office you know you're you're coming off yet another season seeing a division rival win it all there's been a lot of criticism of the organization uh you've had to overcome a lot of hurdles this off season but at bit you were arguably the most active team all winter and one of the most stagnant markets we've seen so after all of this turnover, where do you and Justin feel this roster is at right now? And frankly, do you believe you built a team capable of, you know, overtaking the Rangers and finally overcoming the Astros? No, I, I guess in reverse order, yes, we do feel like the, this team has the ability to do that. And, you know, I feel like we're typically one of the most active teams in the league in the off seasons. And, and I, we, we, we tend to be active uh, when we're sitting still. So, you know, at, at the, the, this off season was a little different for us in that we effectively reshaped uh, a good part of our offensive club uh, coming off of a trio of strong seasons, you know, and I, and I guess my thought there is that, that we, we needed to find, a better way to to get closer and and ultimately surpass the Rangers and Astros and we feel like last year we did that in in multiple ways unfortunately we didn't do it in the win column and you know it's we we played on par with both of those clubs for most of the year and, and we fell short now we have to figure out how to how to catch up and pass them by we've heard from Justin that a lot of teams had very little interest in trading for lower level prospects this winter. And that kind of stagnated the market as a whole, but you guys were still able to make a lot of trades and did most of your heavy lifting that way as per usual. Um, could you describe what maneuvering the trade market was like this winter? You know, I, I actually think the trade market this off season was more active, at least mm -hmm. in terms of discussion, uh, if not in actual trades, but maybe even in actual trades, it was more active this off season than in, any off season in recent memory uh, for much of the off season, it actually felt more like a trade deadline scenario where yeah. conversations were happening, you know, fast and furious and, and teams at the top of the food chain and, you know, expected contenders to teams at the bottom who are in rebuilds or, you know, are trying to gobble up prospects. Everybody was interested in, in maneuvering the trade market. And I think that was probably reflective of a of a free agent market that might not have been as robust as it has been in, in the last few years. And uh, and teams like we have over the years identifying specific players who fit your puzzle. And, you know, 
you just have a bigger group of players that fit those those holes when you open it up to 29 other clubs in trade. You're dealing now with a big pool of players rather than just those who've achieved free agency. I know you don't want to do anything that could jeopardize the long-term health of the organization, but I've been curious to see how your philosophy might evolve as we get deeper into this team's competitive window. I'm sure some of this is just dictated by what's on the market, of course, but what has to fall into place for you to get very aggressive with trading your higher end prospects for potentially, you know, more short term gain? Well, I think we did that in, in July of 22. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's a, it, it tends to go unnoticed because last year we were a little more quiet. You know, last year at the deadline, I think we were right at 500 behind five teams trying to climb over, you know, and none of us could have expected, you know, myself included, could have expected the scorching August that we had after the trade deadline. But, you know, as we went into the trade deadline, we had to make tough decisions. And, you know, part of the reason why the deadline is is deeper in the season is to give you a chance to assess. And, right. you know, in 22, we were, we were comfortably in one of the playoff positions and we felt like this is our chance. And we did, tap into some of our top end prospects to acquire Luis Castillo. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess we will always be willing to do those things, especially if we've identified a player who fits our window in addition right. to a player who we feel like we could potentially extend or sign to stay here. Could you uh, eventually, you know, could you envision eventually maybe where you're in a situation like last year where you're kind of hovering around 500, you're kind of on the fringes of playoff contention but maybe because you're more like five years into the competitive window than two, you get a bit more aggressive. You know, I, I don't really think it's about the number of years you're into the, 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 the competitive window mm-hmm. because right now our, our goal is to always be in the competitive window. And, and we feel like a young core, I, I think, you know, by roster right now, at least by our projections, we should line up as one of the five youngest teams in major league baseball again. And, you know, that's a, we want to be young and sustainable with a productive farm system and do it for a long time. You know, mm-hmm. that being said, if the situation or the circumstance you just described happens in July of 2024, and we feel like we are trending in that moment, we're playing well, somebody else is coming back the other way, then we may mm-hmm. take our shot and, and do that thing. It's a, you know, I, I think anytime you're acquiring players at the deadline, you, you're trying to balance present and future. And mm-hmm. the, the perfect storm for us is when you are getting players who have, you know, who can become part of that sustainable core. And, and again, I'll, I'll refer to the rock. Colby, you got anything for Jerry? Yeah, I actually want to go back to uh, the deadline for a second. Um, just in general, we see now with the extra wild card that teams, a lot of teams, most teams are still in the race when we get to the deadline. Would you, would you be in favor of uh, the league pushing the deadline back a couple of weeks to kind of give teams a little bit more time to find out who they are? Or are you satisfied with where the deadline is right now? Because I, I know a lot of fans would like to see the deadline push back because, you know, you, you have a good two weeks at the end of the deadline there and all of a sudden you're buying and there's more buyers and sellers after August 15th, for example. Yeah, I sure would. And and I think the, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that the other 29 clubs would all feel the same way because it just gives you more time to make good decisions. And, uh, you know, like last year, if we would have had an extra couple of weeks, our behavior may have been a little bit different. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that being said, I the, the, the trade deadline where it is does provide you ample time to get a good read on what your team is about. And I, you know, I think uh, I, I, I do follow hockey a little bit. And I, I just I, I saw something the other day from Chris Letang with the Pittsburgh Penguins, who, you know, are in a really unusual position for them and that they're not that they're not a buyer at the deadline in theory. And they've never experienced that. And, and he said, ah, you know, we had we had the last five, six months to put ourselves in a better position than we have. Now we just have to take a chance for what it is. So, you know, our decisions will be made over over a longer view and it's i we've been you know we've been in positions where we don't really have a shot in in the postseason you know and and we would be more inclined to to buy on the market if it was a player that we felt like could could we could add to that core so uh one of the things that i've sat through the last few years uh over the last few years is uh, mariners teams that 
get to the finish line, they're in position, and then they get eliminated in game 161, 162. I've sat through all those. I'm just curious, is there something, you know, organizationally that can change to prevent that and kind of push through the finish line? Is it just about acquiring the right set of players, or is there something in messaging or, or preparedness or anything like that that maybe you could tweak, that maybe could be tweaked so that instead of, you know, being eliminated in the last couple of days of the season, we're in the playoff position. I think it's been four times in the last eight or nine years that the Mariners have been eliminated in the last, on the last day of the season, essentially. Is, is there anything other than just getting new players and trying again that could, uh, that you think could uh, help solve that problem? I, my, my easy answer to that question is win more in April and May. And, you know, and we won't put ourselves in that position and, you know, we have oddly enough. And I think, I think the, you know, it's, the offensive game is a little tougher in Seattle in the first, let's call it six, eight weeks of the season. And, you know, our offense generally has struggled to score runs in the first couple of months. We don't really have as 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 key or, or you know, big an issue with it as the season goes on. And T-Mobile actually becomes pretty home run friendly as the weather warms. You know, that being said, there are so many opportunities earlier in the season. And, and this past season was a great example where simply just putting a ball in play, a fly ball or a ground ball, you know, with runners in scoring position would give us that one or two extra wins, then we wouldn't have to worry about it. And, you know, the the easy answer is let's win game 161 and, and that takes care of it. But, you know, in reality, if you win game six, you know, that might take care of it too. More from our conversation with Jerry DePoto in just a moment. But first, a reminder, this episode of the Locked On Mariners podcast is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV as soon as possible. Fire TV also recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us here at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports from March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots of more not to mention great news entertainment gaming travel and cooking videos as well check out fire tv channels on fire tv and alexa devices and if you haven't checked out fire tv channels you should trust me on this to learn more visit amazon.com slash locked on fire tv uh, you know you, you've talked about this offense and the, the early season struggles and you guys brought in a a new uh, hitting coach and, and Brant Brown, he's going to be your your offensive coordinator. How is he going to help in assessing uh, or addressing uh, some of those issues early season and just over the course of the year? And what is this offensive philosophy you think going to look like ultimately with this team? You know, I, I don't know if the offensive philosophy changes much, if at all. I, I think the the philosophy on its own is pretty basic. You know, we're not we're not we didn't we didn't break open the atom, but Brownie's been with us before. And, you know, the, the whole concept with with our offense and that Brownie brings to the table is be prepared, know your opponent, dominate the strike zone and touch home plate. And, and you know, so often you get you, you get caught up in the mechanics of a swing. And, you know, at any given time, you're going to have 13 position players on your active roster. And those 13 position players are almost always thinking about the mechanics of their swing first. And, right. you know, our goal is to just make the first thought touching home plate. And, and how do we make that happen? Because you can do that, you know, with or without a, a perfect swing. And, and, and I think that's what Brownie brings to the dance. We have wonderful hitting coaches and, you know, Jared DeHart's done a great job. We're sneaky better than people think offensively and, and have been, but, you know, we needed a different element in the messaging to try to translate some of what we do well offensively into more runs. And because that's something we're pretty mediocre at over time and we would like to be better. So can you can kind of describe what maybe differentiates Brown's role from Jared DeHart's role? Because I, I, we a lot of listeners have been kind of confused about the the role offensive coordinator, right? Because that's not really a term we hear a lot in baseball. That's more of like a football thing, right? So 
what's kind of uh what what is he focusing on compared to DeHart? I think just that JD's time is spent mostly in in the cages with the players, kind of crafting swings, getting them to a position mm -hmm. where they're comfortable on time, talking about you know the philosophy and preparation for a game. Now that becomes Brownie. That's more of a coordinator type of position where you know talking about that day's pitcher, the opponent on hand, what our goals are that game, and to try to have a a, a series of goals or a set of goals that are specific to each hitter's skill set, like what an opposing pitcher might do with that hitter. And, and if you are tasked with coaching a hitter swing, preparing him for, for what's coming, managing all the tech that we have downstairs in the cages, and then putting together a game plan that's unique for 13 different players, that's a pretty tough job. So, you know, going out and, and bringing Brownie in, who was with us when we got here in 2016, 17, before leaving for the Dodgers, you know, he's had success. He's been to the top of the mountain. He's got a World Series ring. He knows what it looks like. And he's just got a different personality and a, and a, and a different way of delivering a message that I think is generally consistent with ours. But we flooded one guy with just too much work, and we're just trying to distribute it a little more evenly. Gotcha. Colby, you got anything for Jerry? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh, this roster. There's been a few injury uh, things that have popped up uh, this spring. Um so far, nothing too, too serious, but uh, one of the guys that, you know, is is a pretty uh, polarizing player for our listeners is uh, Luis Urias. He's DH'd a couple times. He's playing third base again today. Got off to a slow start in the spring. How is he doing? Is is he going to be ready for opening day, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I, but, again, we have three weeks or, or thereabouts right. to, to to work into it. You know, Luis – I. I guess I don't understand. He's coming off a rough year. Uh, there's and similar to you know Josh Rojas last year when we acquired him at the deadline. You know I couldn't be any more impressed with how Rojas has looked this spring. You know and and Luis the two years prior to to last year, pretty good player. You know I mean this guy was playing regularly at a key position for a playoff team and and was a key contributor who's just now entering the the center of his prime and. You know, he was a player that we targeted simply because we think a bounce back is likely. And and I think the projection systems kind of agree with that. And, you know, he's he's skilled enough to play multiple positions and and he's he manages the strike zone quite well. He's got a little bit more power than you think. And, you know, and it the versatility that it gives our lineup. You know, Polanco can play multiple positions. You've got Urias, Rojas, Dylan Moore, J.P. Crawford, Sam Haggerty. You know, a number of players who can rotate in and out of, of different positions. And I think it, it allows us to manage our roster within our roster and, and not get into situations where for three months we're just absorbing suboptimal performance. So, and we can make change without making definitive roster moves that cost you players. How about uh, Gregory Santos? How's he doing? You know, Gregory, and I'll throw Matt Brash in, in this bucket too. Um, we're we're very encouraged. Gregory's already in a throwing program, and the ball flies out of his hand. I I think he wants to throw more than we're allowing him to throw right now, which is a positive thing. And um, yeah, I, I thought that was a, a big get for us this off season. And you know, twenty four year old with that kind of stuff, that kind of performance, and and uh, fits in very well here. Came in with a with a lat issue uh, that, that he suffered, maybe the second bullpen he threw after getting into Arizona, where he was early down here. And similarly with Matt Brash, they both kind of came in firing bullets. And, you know, sometimes when you stretch it out like that and you're throwing 100 in, in February, uh, you, you need to slow it down a little bit. But we're right now encouraged – in both cases, we think both will pitch for us certainly in April, uh, and we'll take it for what it's worth. We have to we have to let this play out. Matt hasn't yet started his throwing progression, but I want to say highly unlikely that either is ready for our opening day roster, but very likely that both pitch for us in, in the first month based on you know the, the information we have right now. Gotcha, gotcha. That's good news overall. Yeah. Uh, so. We like to try and, uh, you know, ask the listeners a little bit about something they want to know. And I think pretty overwhelmingly, the biggest question we've gotten this winter is about extensions, notably guys like Cal Raleigh, Logan Gilbert, George Kirby. 
so I guess we'll just ask, like, is that something that's on the radar? Is that something that you're maybe you're, you're pushing off? Uh, you know, you're just pushing back a little bit just to, cause you have time. You obviously have time. Those guys are nowhere near free agency, but is that a topic that's been broached or are you just kind of letting it play out as things stand right now? Yeah. Letting it play out really isn't our style. So <laughs> yeah, we've, we, I, from, from the very start, we've, we've always maintained that that's our goal is, is to, bring in players who fit our core, make sure that, that, you know, contractually we extend them to the point that they're able to, you know, we can, we can fix a roster. This is what it looks like. And, and we have a number of players on our current roster that we count in that bucket. Some are already extended and some we would like to, and we've already had numerous conversations on, on a handful of different players. And um, they're not easy things to do. Uh, you know, it's a, they're, you're really threading a needle with, with a, with a player in a club to find the right marriage over time, especially mm-hmm. when the players that we are talking with are so far away from their free agency. You know, it's, it's much harder for the player to assess where they fit in the market um, at, un, until they get a little bit closer, which, you know, we are anything from the early, uh, I guess the early career extensions that we've done, you know, one or two have gone very, very well, and, and one or two have not gone as well. And, you know, we have uh, we have done some that, like with Luis Castillo, where it's a five plus, it's really hard to do extensions with players who are a year away from free agency. So okay. we're kind of in the hot zone right now with the guys that are those, you know, the two plus player to the four plus player. And, you know, we'll be as aggressive as we can be in trying to make sure that those guys stay with us. More from our conversation with Jerry DePoto in just a moment. But first, a reminder, this episode of the Locked On Mariners podcast is brought to you by Prize Picks. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there is no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Conference tournaments are here, which means the biggest moments in college basketball are getting closer. Be a part of the action on Prize Picks for both men's and women's college basketball. And tonight in the pros, I'm taking Josh Green more than six and a half points against the Heat and Jeremy Sohan less than 14 and a half points against the Kings. Download the app today and use the promo code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to hundred dollars. That is promo code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Uh, I actually wanted to ask you this when we had you on last year, uh, but we weren't able to get to it, so I'll ask you now. Um, when you and Justin received your new titles. Did your dynamic and the way you divvy up responsibilities change at all? Like, for example, what did the day you guys traded for Mitch Haniger and Luke Rayleigh look like? Uh, I would say that that day, what did it look like? That was a little different, you know, we, uh, mostly because those were two deals that I was generally running point on. But that's not that's not unique. Uh, there were other deals that we made during the offseason, like the Jorge Polanco deal where Justin ran point. And mm. We generally try to divvy them up based on relationships and, you know, who who has the relationship with someone on the other side where you feel like you can make real progress because trades are really hard to make in this league. And, you know, I I guess the other part is you know, I, I've been with Justin now since the offseason of 2011 and you know I've watched him evolve as a front office executive. And when he was promoted to general manager, a real point of focus for me was making sure that he had the same job that I had when, when I got the opportunity to be a general manager for the first time. And, you know, to that end, we don't do anything, you know, roster wise, player movement. You know, we'll, we each oversee various departments, you know, as a general rule, I oversee scouting player development and major league. Justin will oversee front office, the, 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 the analytics team, and a lot of what goes into making the roster. But he has always, and this dates back, you know, for as long as I've known Justin, he has a knack with, with roster building that just makes him different than, than anybody else I've worked with. And, and as a rule, we don't make a single move without having multiple discussions with each other about that. And, mm-hmm. and then keying in the appropriate people, be it, you know, scouts, you know, front office, other members of our front office, our analysts, or where the group downstairs. Uh, two real quick things. First things first, any prospects, you know, opening your eyes this, this spring, any surprises or 
I guess maybe not surprises, but obviously Cole Young is is having a, a very nice spring, and and Harry Ford's, you know, certainly had his moments. But is any, are there any you know prospects who maybe have surprised you a bit uh, this spring? Well, I, yeah, this is the answer. Now you got me livened up a little bit. The you know, <laughs> first, I, I really can't say enough about how good Cole Young has looked, and and he's he is a he had, he's a no panic hitter. You know, he gets in the box and it's he looks relaxed and and for someone who's not taking it a bat above a ball to to climb in in a big league camp like that is is pretty impressive you know i do think that we've seen really positive things from ryan bliss uh, ryan's not yet had a chance to play in the big leagues but i think he has shown us the ability to manage both sides of of the bag in the middle of the infield defensively throws plenty good enough to play shortstop He's a seven runner and and he has a knack putting the ball in play. And, you know, he's he's shown us sneaky power. You know, he's shown us some hit ability. And you know, we're really encouraged by that. Some of the guys who have come over uh, my I, I joked around. This is the the maybe the most notable spring in my memory where when I come in in the morning, the first thing I do is turn right to go to the backfields and and watch what's happening. We, we have a group of teenage hitters right now. And. Colt Emerson, Johnny Farmello, Ty Pete, Laz Montes, Michael Arroyo. It is so exciting to Aiden Smith. So exciting, exciting to watch these guys go. And, you know, Johnny Farmello in the big league games. I mean, you would have a hard time. It, there's If you looked and said, hey, which one of these guys was in high school last year? You, you probably wouldn't pick Johnny as he's running in the walls, making catch, you know, lasering opposite field gappers and, and you know, yanking triples. He's been incredibly impressive, and mm -hmm. as has Colt Emerson. Uh, you know, to come over, he's 18 years old, and and put together six, eight pitch at bats versus guys with the kind of stuff they're facing, just so impressive. And, and I guess I would, you know, finish up with Logan Evans, who, mm. if you don't know about Logan Evans, dig in. Uh, we got a lot more than we banked on on draft day with Logan, and um, you know, he was he was a, a guy who had good stuff but struggled to perform in, in the ACC at Pitt. And, you know, he came into our system and immediately adapted to some of our programs. And now this, this past off season, we've seen his stuff go from good to unbelievable. And, you know, he is, he's sitting in the high nineties. He has touched 99 pit pitching at 97, 98 with bowling ball sink and, you know, multiple plus secondary pitches and he commands them all at, uh, to, to the point where it, it, it draws a crowd now when he's throwing. And I think Scott Service sidled up to me the other day after Logan threw in a big league game and said, tell me about Evans. Who is this guy? And I said, I, it's a good story. <laughs> so uh, th those are the guys that have really stood out in the early going here. And, and I'm sure they're going to be others because it's a fun young team. I know you love Brody Hopkins as well. That dude's an insane athlete. Oh, my God. Uh, Brody Hopkins. There's I, I'll, This one is an ex Last fall, I was down here for our HP camp. And, you know, in HP camp, it's all about building up your body, building up your mind, learning nutrition. And, and it's it, very little of it is baseball skill. It's all athletic, gathering athletic traits. And, you know, Johnny Farmello is probably the fastest runner in our organization. He's, a, he's borderline 80 runner. It's, it's, it's explosive. And I was down here for HP camp, and they were doing, you know, shuttle races and you know it's 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 short bursts but you know it, it is a race and the the players get to pick their opponent and you know johnny who was one of the group from last year's draft that was in seattle so i built some you know starter relationship with him johnny picked brody hopkins to to run again then i i i joked with him i, I said i said picking the pitcher what are, what are you doing that's not you know you, pick an athlete he goes <laughs> He said, oh, I picked him because he's the guy that can beat me. And and then I watched, and I, you know, I'll be damned if, if Brody Hopkins didn't beat him in the first race. And then I found out that Brody Hopkins is not only insanely athletic, but he's also highly competitive. And his fastball has also jumped to the point where, you know, he's high 90s and and there's an expectation. I, I think the, the idea is that, you know, shorten him up and there's a very good chance that you're going to have electric stuff that looks kind of like the Santos Munoz, you know, that, that Matt Brash type bucket, which is exciting for us. Well, Jerry, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. Looking forward to seeing this ball club here in a few weeks. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Take care.
You got it, guys. Sorry the lights went out. I, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to do it for our show. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Locked On Mariners podcast. For Colby Patnode, I'm Ty Dan Gonzalez. Be sure to give us a follow on Twitter at LO underscore Mariners. You can follow me at Ty Dan Gonzalez and Colby at CPAT11. That's CPAT11. You can also find all that stuff in the description of this episode. Thank you again for making us your first listen. Have yourself a beautiful baseball day, and we'll see you next time. Peace.